Can you tell the history of Big Star in the 70s for me, please? You know, my I, maybe not so briefly, but uh, my my first contact with Andy Hummel was was in the seventh grade. Uh, he was in the eighth grade, and we we had a mutual friend actually that introduced us. That uh, <clears throat> sometime later, well, actually, I was uh, maybe five years later. I was a senior in high school, and uh, was playing drums in the the Memphis State production of Hair. It was the uh, first off-Broadway production of, of the musical. Andy came to see that production, and <clears throat> we kind of we got together again. He came up on stage after the, in the, the grand finale of the play, and uh, you know where the, the audience members are invited on stage to sing Let the Shun Sunshine In. And uh, Andy came over and, and uh, said hello, and we got to talking, and he invited me to a jam session, and which I thought would be fun. Uh, and that, that wound up including Chris Bell and Terry Manning and probably Tom Eubanks uh, and a guy named Steve Ray. And, and we had a good time. I thought there was, uh, you know, I th even even at that jam, uh, it, you know, I thought things were pretty artful and, and creative. Uh, but, you know, that <clears throat> that evolved into really Chris and Andy and I being in a band together and... Uh, Sometime, I guess, in 1970 or 70, early 71, uh, Alex, you know, was making the decision to move back to Memphis, and uh, Alex came to see us at the VFW Club in uh, close to downtown Memphis, and uh, apparently he liked what he saw and joined up. Um, and uh, we had this, you know, idea to 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 record some original material together and and maybe shop it uh to majors in in you know new york and uh john fry i think at that point said hey you know i'd i'd love to be a part of this and then have been thinking about uh starting a label with uh you know an affiliation with stacks so you know john fry got uh, ardent records cranked up and um <clears throat> you know we started working up original material and um that's that's sort of the history of the the uh, beginning of the band, and we did uh, you know the first album was released a April of seventy two, and uh, you know the the rock writers really liked the band, but <clears throat> they seemingly were the were the were, were the the only people that heard it, um, and yeah the drift the band kind of drifted apart after that. Um, and we're invited to um, play a rock writers festival, and I actually wish I had the the, the date. The, Arden, an Arden Records um, marketing guy, uh, John King, was putting this rock writers festival together that included Bud Scapa and Cameron Crow and and Danny Goldberg and um, Richard Meltzer. Uh, Dave Marsh, a lot of, you know, kind of uh, pretty famous rock writers, folks that, you know, went on to kind of make a name for themselves as, as writers. Um, and we had such a great time doing that that uh, we decided to get back together and do another album, uh, which was Radio City. Um, <clears throat> and we did that and, um, you know, did a few dates. Uh, along with that, went up to New York and played Max's Kansas City and went to, um, you know, Boston and opened for Badfinger. But, you know, pretty much just a handful of dates behind that. And again, nothing much happened with regard to record sales. Uh, but, you know, again, rock writers really liked the band. Um, well, and, and I should clarify, Chris Bell left the band after the first record um, to kind of for a solo effort and then... We got Radio City done, and um, shortly thereafter, Andy left the band. So it left Alex and myself, and um, we got together and did, um, I guess this was sometime in 74, uh, the third album, which we completed, I guess, in 74, and uh, but... You know, and that was shopped around to major labels and maybe some independents and... and the response to it in some cases, ooh, do I have to listen to that again? 
Uh, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't very well received. Uh, obviously, it took three years for that for a company to step forward and release it. It was originally released by um, Passport PVC and and uh, in the states and Oro Records in England. But uh, that kind of brings us up, and then and then I left uh, for various reasons. But uh, one of which was to go back to school. It didn't look like Big Star was panning out to be a, a good career move. But I mean, it was a great creative move and had a lot of fun at doing it and a lot of satisfaction. But um, so you know, Alex and I went our separate ways, and and uh, probably late seventy four. Well, after that gap, what was it like reforming in the early 90s? Well, you know, that was, uh, <clears throat> again, seemingly by chance. And um, I, a guy named Mike uh, Mulvihill g- called me and asked if I wanted to, to come to Missouri and play a gig with Alex and play some big star songs. And I said, sure, you know, g- uh, give Alex a call. And if Alex agrees, you know, I'll be glad to do it. So uh, they indeed found a phone number on Alex and called Alex, and Alex agreed, and and we were both going up there to just, you know, with our expenses covered, we weren't really going to make any money doing it. Just seemed like a, a fun idea, um, and Mike and his partner, and I forget his partner's name, <clears throat> actually uh, were looking for a couple of other folks to to round out the lineup you know, for guitar and bass, and uh, they, they asked a few people and did whatever schedule conflicts, you know, there were. So uh, I suggested that they call John Auer, whom I'd met through, uh, they, John and Ken and the Posies were signed to Geffen Records at the time, and I I had uh, <clears throat> been introduced to them by Gary Gers, their A&R guy, or A&R guy at Geffen. So, uh, Mike gives uh, John Auer a call, and and <clears throat> John agrees, and then Ken says, "But wait, I can play bass." So Ken came along and played bass, and so it rounded out the lineup. And <clears throat> we, uh, you know, I guess initially we were just going to show up in Missouri and play, um, unrehearsed, and and just, I, you know, I can't imagine what it, that would have been like, uh, but. Uh, Bud Scapa at Zoo Records, uh, Jim Rondinelli, and who actually produced that the, the, the live, what would be the live record from Missouri, um, you know, gave us a call and said, "Hey, we'd like to record this and release it on Zoo," and it gave us a little bit of a budget, and so we flew up to to uh, Seattle and rehearsed a couple of days, and uh, then you know performed the gig, which was in a tent uh, just outside this big arena at the University of Missouri in Columbia. Uh, but I don't know what it was like. It was, you know, being on stage at that gig was, uh, yeah, a great experience. You look out in the audience and people were singing along and seemed to know the lyrics and there were big smiles on people's faces. And uh, it was, you know, it was a great time. It was a reason to to do it more often. So did that lead to a flurry of activity or after that or basically what happened after or since the Missouri gig well since the Missouri gig we uh, later that year uh, the latter part of that summer I think we went to uh, did some dates like five dates in Europe we played in London at the Grand and we played the Reading Festival and we played in Leeds and we did a festival in Holland uh, called the Lowlands Festival then came back and I think we probably played tramps in New York and, and maybe the Metro and Chicago. And um, the following year, we went to Japan, did five dates in Japan, came back and uh, played the Fillmore in San Francisco and then the Metro again in Chicago. And uh, a couple of months later, went back to Los Angeles and played the House of Blues and uh, were invited to do the Tonight Show. Uh, which it was the Halloween uh, show. Interesting. Uh, not a very interesting show, but it was an interesting event. We had Mayor Koch on the show, and 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 I think it was Jennifer Tilly and maybe uh, Matthew Broderick. But um, <clears throat> I don't know. Yeah, and and you know, since we've just we've done two or three dates every year, it's just uh, enough to have a really good time at it. 
but not enough to get burned out on it. Well, obviously that leads into uh, what made the band decide to do the new record. Uh, there was a series of events that led up to that, and one of which we were on stage, uh, the Mean Fiddler, I think, in London in August of 2001, and uh, Alex told the audience that we were all going to get together and do a new record, which is really, I mean, we talked about it in passing before, but that was the first official notice. And, uh, you know, we pro probably talked a little bit about it after that, but um, nothing seemed to materialize until, you know, a couple of years later anyway. And I think Ken was talking to Alex, and Ken was mentioning maybe working up some some old Big Star songs to add to the set. And Alex said, you know, you, why don't we work up some new ones? And uh, I think that's sparked, got the ball rolling for... Um, for this new record, and um, Alex came up with a plan to write and record a song a day. That's one song, and uh, <clears throat> we would do you know do that for fifteen days and pick twelve of those uh, fifteen songs, do overdubs for five days, and then mix. And so that was a you know we had a plan about how to do this record and something I could take to you know a record label and and. Um, you know, pitched to a record label and, and maybe have a home for another record, uh, which we did, and uh, pitched it to Jeff Rugby at Ryko Disc, and and uh, I'd, I'd known Jeff for quite a while, and, and it was really comfortable working with Jeff. We'd done the deal for the third album with Ryko Disc, and then uh, Chris Bell's record, and then this live radio broadcast that we did. So Ryko had some, you know, big star music in their catalog, uh, and it made sense. They, uh, you know, we gave them this plan. They and we had a budget associated with it, and they signed off on it, and and uh, actually just left us alone to do the record, which is you know pretty remarkable. People like to one hear the songs beforehand, and two like to you know know how things are are going along in the process. But they, um, you know, they left us to our own devices. Was that a quicker pace than? The other records were kind of done at? Well, it was a more, for me, it was a more challenging pace uh, because there was a deadline. We had certain dates that we had to get this record done in um, to stay on budget and to stay within everybody's traveling schedules. Uh, so, and, the, and well, you know, that and the idea of, of writing and recording a song a day. Uh, certainly added to the challenge and you know some days we'd come in and and someone had of an idea and we'd immediately sit down and sort of work through it and work it out and, and get the music done uh, and then some days we'd sit there and and you know think gee what are we going to do today and uh in one of those days um adam hill the assistant of the project came up with uh, mine exclusively and uh, he wound up pulling it off my wall. I had the, the single of that on the wall in my office at Ardent. And um, pulled it off the wall. We had a list and thought, gee, let's let's do another version of that. Because that, that original version was uh, Alex and I recorded with Teenage Fan Club in, uh, in 93. And it was just available through the New Music Express magazine. So uh, we, we, you know, re-recorded that and... Um, but we, you know, we uh, we got it done. It was pretty amazing, and uh, you know, I don't know that I would suggest that for everybody, but it's it's a neat challenge, and you know, kind of satisfying to know that uh, we were all up for the challenge. It worked out really well. I'm really proud of the record. Well, as for the rest of 2005, uh, what does Big Star expect to happen? You know, I, in in my whole career, I don't know that I've ever expected anything to happen. I uh, I've always hoped, maybe, but I've never expected. Um, I you know we're 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 trying to work out schedules with the posies and um, and uh, the schedule that would accommodate some big star gigs. So maybe uh, right now we're sort of focusing on January, February of two thousand six. Uh, you know, well, they, you know, obviously the big star record comes out September twenty seventh. In 2005, and um, you know, Ryko Disc have been uh, really 
helpful and handy and, and, you know, doing a good job of, of, uh, you know, marketing this record. And I know I've done a lot of interviews, so that's a good indication. And what's next for big star? I, uh, <laughs> that's the last one on here. I guess we kind of answered it, but you're, you're not writing for the fifth record already or anything. Uh, no, it's it and Jay, if we uh if we stuck to to the historical precedence of thirty years in between records, I don't guess anybody would be around. But uh you know, I, I'm just excited to have this record out there and are coming out. It's um what's today, the twenty first. Uh the record comes out on the twenty seventh. We'll see what happens and see what kind of dates we can do and how much fun we have with this. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll decide what to do in the future later on down the road. And the one more question, bonus question, what exactly was Noel stroking? <laughs> Noel was stroking his violin. Excellent. Thank you, Jody. <laughs>